Welcome everyone. My name is Adria Vassal and I'm the managing editor here at Corporate Knights Sustainable Economy magazine. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Corporate Knights is located in the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat in Dish of One Spoon territory. Now, I think that uh, treaty is particularly fitting in relation to the panel we're hosting today. Uh, Dish of One Spoon Treaty, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, was between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee's that bound them to share and protect our land with the understanding that we all have a responsibility to ensure that the dish is ever empty and doing so by taking care of the land and all the creatures that are on it. Which is why I think it's so apt that we have a panel today of sustainability youth leaders who are all working on essentially doing just that. So I'd like to welcome you all officially to the launch event of the 2022 Corporate Nights annual list of our 30 under 30 sustainability, sustainability youth leaders in Canada. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> uh, now our 30 under 30 is uh, basically a process that we open up every spring. We uh, invite people across the country to send in nominations of youth leaders who they think are leading the charge on sustainability issues across the country and around the world. Uh, we get a flood of nominations and a panel of judges then uh, sifts through the bios and uh, has a really tough time narrowing it down to the top 30. Here with us today, we have, I think last checked, uh, 18 of the 30 under 30 or 17. And um, we're, we're really grateful to have you join us and take the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. So thank you. I'm giving a round of applause because this is a <laughs> non-virtual event. Now, uh, just to give you a quick summary of our agenda, uh, we don't usually have panels with you know, 20 people on them, although Corporate Nights has been known to have very large panels, uh, as Toby, our, our CEO and founder, can attest. Um, we, we will uh, basically go through and check in with each of you on the amazing work that you're doing. Um, but to help kind of make it a bit more manageable, we have grouped you in theme areas that you work on. Some of you are focused on circular economy, or sustainable finance, and we will check in with you as a group um, related to those, those themes. So uh, before we begin, I would like to introduce Jan Guilfoy, who is the president and CEO of Meridian. Um, Meridian has helped make this year's 30 under 30 possible. So we're really pleased to have with, with us Jan today. Uh, she joined Meridian as president and CEO at the beginning of 2002 and uh, has 20 years of experience in senior, as a senior executive in the public and private sector and in cooperative financial services. Um, with a wealth of experience in social impact and leadership. So, so she's a great person to be joining us and kicking things off. Jan? Thank you, Adria. Nice to see everybody. Good morning. I'm calling in from the West Coast, so I'm on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish people, and in particular, the um, Semiamu First Nations. So I'm delighted to join you here from the West Coast, where it's still dark. So an honor to be here uh, for our first virtual 30 under 30 recognition event, and an honor for us at Meridian to serve as presenting sponsors in celebration of all of you, young people who are going to change the world. In keeping with tradition, this year's top 30 under 30 are disruptors, innovators, change makers, and game changers. And you deliver a wide range of innovative, cutting edge climate solutions, exploring and implementing social, cultural and economic inclusion opportunities, affordable and sustainable housing, health equity and well-being and responsible investing. The projects you take on are vital. Our future depends on it. Conversations underway at the UN Climate Summit underscore the urgency to put significant action behind our words. When we think about the way we live and the impact it has on our planet, we know we can't keep living the way we always have. Attention must shift to restoring and nurturing the spaces around us. It's a hopeful idea with 81% of people feeling optimistic about it. The circular economy and creating new pathways to regeneration are critical to sustainability. And this group of leaders being recognized today have already embarked on this journey and people are following. You inspire others across all generations, including me, 
Like you, I found my own impact itch. And so I've been on a personal journey as I come to understand reconciliation and the history of indigenous people. As a mother, the effects of intergenerational impact of the residential school history and devastation to families has hit home for me strongly. And it's made me realize that I am an ally and have an opportunity to create a better future that is different and more inclusive. And as a leader in a financial institution, I understand we have the opportunity to make things better by eliminating barriers to economic equality and creating access to capital for indigenous people and others that may not have had it in the past. This is one of my personal passions and I know we'll be hearing from all of you shortly about your own impact itch. As Meridian's leader, I'm here to tell you we are on a mission aligned with your collective impact agenda. There's a clear connection between how the finance industry operates and the health of our local communities right here in Ontario. As a purpose-driven community-based organization, Meridian is working towards solutions for many of the areas you are working in. Circular economy finance, clean energy, green buildings, addressing economic barriers and access for Indigenous communities. My opinion, business must create the opportunity for change just as much as government. The expectations of companies is to be true to the people who have connections with it. Meridian is on board with that and the world needs more people come on board with sustainability leaders like all of you. On behalf of Meridian, I thank you for the work that you do and for being role models to the young Canadians, inspiring both those who are under 30 and those who still think they are under 30. So congratulations. I'm very much looking forward to the remainder of this session and hearing about all the great work that you're doing. Thanks so much, Jan. Now, we wanted to kick things off uh, with one of the Indigenous leaders that is on this year's 30 Under 30 list. Thanks to Stephanie Wilsey and her team. Uh, Stephanie is a proud Anishinaabe lawyer and active member of the Chippewas of Rama First Nation. And her and her legal team made a historic win this year. Uh, they, for, they secured eight, an $8 billion settlement for three First Nations uh, earlier this year to help rectify their water crisis. Stephanie, I would love to know what drove you, first of all, to become a lawyer and also how you then used your legal superpowers to achieve this historic landmark victory when so many Indigenous communities are, are still struggling to access clean water. Adrian, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, well, I've always wanted to become a lawyer. I think in, in a lot of ways, uh, historically marginalized groups, uh, Indigenous people, our Black and, and Latinx communities, um, we have a whole lifetime of advocacy. And so um, in a lot of ways, um, becoming a lawyer and advocate for uh, your communities or for uh, others is, is a bit of a natural choice, despite the fact that uh, we're generally underrepresented in, in the legal community. And so it was a natural fit. Um, and I also certainly wanted to become a lawyer so that I could help people and, and in particular, uh, my First Nation and, and other First Nations uh, across Canada. Um, in terms of, I guess, my um, involvement in, in this class action and, and this victory. So our, our legal team was instructed by, by these three communities uh, to bring this class action regarding long-term drinking water advisories uh, impacting First Nation communities in Canada. But the class itself included over 300,000 individuals and uh, over 250 First Nations. And so um, each of these individuals in each of these communities were unable to drink their tap water, um, you know, for, for a span um, of at least a year. And so I think the success in large part uh, wasn't necessarily to do with my, my legal superpowers, um, but probably power by numbers and also just such an empathetic and, and tragic story. It was uh, change and justice was long overdue. Um, and it's undeniable, I think everyone can agree that everyone should ha have access to adequate quality and quantity of, of drinking water in their homes. And so, um, well, there's really no amount of money or solution that can be brought by the courts that really brings justice um, to this type of, uh, you know, inequity. 
um, I was I was grateful to be a part of you know this first step towards um, bringing accountability and, and a solution in, in this issue and uh, and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Stephanie. It's uh, incredible when you look around our, our 30 under 30 group, we have such a, a diversity of, of youth leaders working on such a, a wide array of issues, you know, from securing uh, safe drinking water for Indigenous communities uh, to uh, a large handful of our 30 under 30 working on tackling another enormous problem in Canada, um, waste. Uh, Canada produces more waste per capita than any other country in the world. And uh, our next three youth leaders set their sights on tackling this, this massive problem. Uh, Milton, Sanch, Aaron, Mark, I'm going to ask you each individually to tell us a little bit about how you take this problem on and what challenges each of you have overcome to make a dent in the mountains of waste turned out by this country. Milton, do you want to begin and sound? Sure, I, I can get it going. Uh, so just to quickly tell you what we do at Meal Care, we divert surplus food from different food vendors, such as university cafeterias, and we bring that to our partner, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, et cetera. And um, we do that across over eight cities now in Canada. And I, I'd say the biggest challenge initially, and even when we're starting up new chapters, is persevering past the initial no that is almost expected at this point, especially when you're trying to change um, an operation that's been operating in the same way for pretty much, you know, since it started. Uh, and I think one big thing that, that, you know, has to do with pushing past that no is just finding common ground within the stakeholders. So we're all people, you know, we can all agree that giving food to people who need it is something that you know is, is a win for society and uh and just finding a win-win in those situations i think is is what really helped us out and sanj maybe you can tell us a little bit more also about uh you know how much you've you've accomplished in terms of uh food waste avoided yeah. etc for sure meal care um has grown quite a bit we started at uh, Montreal, but now, as Milton said, operate in eight eight cities across Canada, and we've delivered probably close to sixty thousand pounds of food, which even more, oh. uh, as Milton is pointing up, and that which equates to roughly like three hundred thousand dollars, if not more, saved along the the food system. So definitely like a lot of impact. And Milton kind of talked about some of the micro challenges and some of the macro challenges has been like spreading awareness of like the legal framework in Canada, like in particular, the like Good Samaritan Act, which actually protects a lot of our partners um, and allows them to partner with meal care. So it's been a lot of convincing, but obviously very happy with what meal care has accomplished and hope to continue to grow. Sorry, do you mind just unpacking a little bit about the, the Good Samaritan Act? Uh, how does that play into your work? Yeah, of course. So Good Samaritan Act, um, which is like a legal framework across different provinces, um, pretty much allows donors, so businesses, grocery stores, cafeterias to donate with the intent um, of helping others. And they are not going to be like liable for any um, illnesses, damages, as long as it's done in good faith. So like meal care, we just kind of help transport the food and everyone along the entire pipeline um, is protected. And we do check the food. Like we do two checks. So one, when the food is given by the university cafeteria, for instance, and once before it's given to kind of local members of our society. Um, and we've had no issues so far and don't plan to have any issues. Um, and yeah, no, continue, hope to continue to grow. And this is uh, not just your, it well, was not your only day job or is not your actual day job. Uh, Sanchi, you've also got something else on the go at, at this exact moment in time. Can you, can you give us a little preview into your life? Yeah, so right now I'm, I'm a medical student. So currently um, I'm doing anesthesia. So I have a patient right now um, in the OR asleep and I'll probably right after go wake them up and get ready for our next uh, shoulder replacement, which is what we're doing today. So, and same with Milton. Milton's a, a co-founder of another uh, kind of food organization. And maybe if you're interested, you can hit them up about it. But yeah, we're all, all both. And a lot of us here in the group are interested in a lot of different things, hoping to uh, create a more sustainable future. 
Thank you. So if any of you see, uh, if our audience sees uh, Sanj drop out of the off the screen, there's a good reason for that. Um, like we mentioned earlier, uh, I, we know you all have a lot going on today. So thanks for your time. And um, and next up, we have Aaron Andrews. Aaron, uh, you're the executive director of Impact Zero. Can you tell us a little bit about how you tackle the waste problem in Canada and uh, some of the challenges that you faced along the way? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'll also maybe do a quick intro. So Impact Zero, we're all about empowering folks to stand up their own solutions to the circular economy. So I actually started trying to mitigate waste through an e-commerce site. So if folks know refilleries, where you go refill soaps and shampoos in jars, I originally started one that was online way back in 2018, trying to like hustle and do it all myself. But through that process, at the same time, I was actually working at, uh, at TD. I actually worked with Sabrine, um, and who's also on this call. And uh, that was where I was looking more at like systems change. And a lot of things that the bank looks at is large infrastructure type projects, right? So I was kind of thinking how we can change the system to be more circular beyond just one person doing one action. So um, for Impact Zero, that's why we now focus on empowering underrepresented founders who have really good ideas that change the system and empower their community to participate. And we have an accelerator program where we start up, we've started up uh, seven companies to date, one of which was also on the list. She's not here today, Catherine Merritt. She started Case. They were in our first cohort. Um, but yeah, just supporting other people to do stuff and gathering those resources to help people do the good work that they already know that needs to happen. And what are the, some of the challenges that you've overcome to get to where you are? Yeah, I mean, the biggest challenge, I think, for us is, um, is the empowerment thing, right? Because people who want to start an initiative, even if you want to start like a company versus a community organization where, say, maybe you host repair um, workshops for people in your apartment building or something like that, um, there are barriers that prevent people from standing these things up holding down a job, not having time, having kids, right? Like there are so many systemic barriers um, because people need to get paid and climate work um, often at the beginning is not necessarily paid. So that's why for Impact Zero, we've had to kind of figure out how we can be the ones to gather those resources and then work with other companies to help them, um, you know, overcome some of those. So our whole job is removing barriers and it's a learning process. But the biggest thing is just figuring out how we can best help people who are facing massive external barriers that aren't really in our control. So um, yeah, it's a it's a learning process. It's not perfect, but um, you know, working with partners is the biggest thing, um, and building that community. Mark Silverman, as the director of R and D at Evanest, can you tell us a little bit about how you are tackling Canada's waste challenge? and um, and some of the challenges that uh, you've had to overcome along the way. Thanks. Um, so for me, I think one of the really interesting things about the question is that at Evanes, we actually used waste to replace waste. So when you look at many agricultural processes, there's all sorts of natural waste. Like if you think of corn, you can think of corn cobs, right? You can actually, instead of leaving it as waste material, you can, we upcycle it into compostable packaging that can then be reused as a value added product and at the same time, displace harmful and persistent single use packaging uh, from the environment. In terms of the challenges though, I definitely think that um, in the field of sustainable packaging, there's all these questions around compostability, biodegradability, recyclability, and the complexity of this information for each type of material and the proper disposal of these materials varies from region to region and material type to material type. So that makes it very, very confusing for the consumer. I'll give you two examples. When you think of like PLA, which is a polylactic acid um, compostable bioplastic, it's actually only industrially compostable, not home compostable. It doesn't degrade in the environment and it can't be recycled, right? So the average mm -hmm. consumer doesn't even know that. The other thing is, if you think of polystyrene, it is ranked as recyclable, but polystyrene foam, you know, that styrofoam clamshell packaging that we see everywhere, that's never recycled because it's 90% air. And so the economics of recycling it just aren't there. Right. And for the average consumer, this is just way too confusing. And so I think that one of the biggest barriers is um, the education of the average consumer. And we really need to invest more in resources to make um, 
the consumers aware and make the circular economy a reality. Um, I'd say the second biggest challenge is the lack of modern infrastructure to cope with the massive amounts of plastic waste and other waste that we churn out. Um, we really need to advocate for an improvement in waste management infrastructure with policymakers at every level of government if we really want to have a change towards the circular economy. And I think we can look at certain countries like, you know, Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands, where um, they've taken it a lot further to get to a circular economy. And we can look to those countries as uh, leaders in terms of examples. Thank you so much. Uh, we can have a whole panel discussion on each of your categories, by the way, team. <laughs> I'm sorry that, uh, you know, the time is so limited, but we're, we're trying to get to uh, to all of the amazing work that you do. Um, and uh, I know the the challenges around you know uh, waste are vast uh, in this country, and the inconsistent uh, recycling and composting from city to city is uh, is a rabbit hole we can go down for sure. Um, and we'll we'll have to invite you all back to other panels in the future as well. <laughs> now we are uh, going to be shifting gears to our clean tech leaders. And this is a huge issue in Canada because last checked, actually Canada had more top 100 global clean tech companies than any other country in the world outside of the US. But uh, as the CEO of Mars Discovery District said in an op-ed this summer, that we have a huge gap between innovation that's happening in clean tech and implementation. And too many of our great Canadian companies are failing to get their products adopted broadly. So since we have a number of our 30 under 30 uh, in the clean tech, clean energy field, we just want to go around and ask you each how you are working on solving that gap. And what do you think the secret is to scaling up clean tech in Canada and in, what, in Ethan's case, around the world? Shivani, did you want to kick things off for us? And tell us a little bit about uh, your work as director of developments and partnerships at and our star. Sure, and I apologize, I, I don't have my video on today, um, but I, so I work with Enter Store. We're an energy storage focused project developer, owner and operator. So basically exactly what you mentioned there around how do we um, get from the innovation to the actual implementation is what we focus on specifically for energy storage. So. Um, working on going from an idea to actual sort of construction and operations of large energy storage infrastructure across the country. Um, and in terms of the, I guess, the, the innovation around it, I think there's, there's a lot of challenges as we navigate the regulatory frameworks and all of that kind of stuff. But really, I think where we've found a lot of success um, and where we think infrastructure needs to go in general is thinking about the how of not just what are we building, we all know we need to build a lot of renewable generation and a lot of energy storage, um, but the how of who is going to own it, how is it going to be built in ways that empower communities rather than um, building infrastructure in the same paradigms that we've built it in the past and make sure that we're really shifting what the future looks like as we do that. Um, so that's been our big focus at Understore and we work in, in partnership with communities, uh, Indigenous communities across the country. Um, to build out basically very innovative new technologies for energy storage, like everything from flywheels to compressed air energy storage and a lot of lithium ion battery projects um, and really see, I guess, the need for scaling that up uh, in, a, in a big way uh, across Canada and, and, and globally. Sorry, just to interject uh, for our audience members who aren't familiar with flywheels, could you just uh, clarify the term for us? Sure. So flywheels are essentially a form of um, kinetic energy storage. Basically, if you think of large metal cylinders that are spinning um, and storing energy through their rotation as they spin. And uh, you mentioned some of the work you're doing with Indigenous communities. Corporate Knights has written a few articles on uh, the great work being done uh, across uh, First Nations, across Canada, uh, to ramp up renewables on reserves. Uh, how has, how, can you tell us a little bit more about that work? Mm -hmm. So I think across the country, Indigenous communities are certainly leading the way um, on, on owning and developing a, a number of renewable energy projects. Uh, at Enerstore, we're working on a 50-50 partnership with Six Nations of the Grand River, 
uh, to build, as an example, to build um, a 250 megawatt, 1000 megawatt hour lithium ion battery storage facility, which is, uh, which will be one of the, the largest energy storage facilities in the world, um, and certainly the largest in Canada when it's constructed. So I think examples like that and projects like that really show that it's, it's that Indigenous communities and communities are really leading the way, not just kind of responding to what's 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 happening elsewhere, but really developing these opportunities um, themselves and in partnership with progressive uh, organizations, uh, which is really exciting to see. Thanks, Shivani. Jonathan Edwards, you are uh, tackling our, 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 our clean tech problems uh, from another angle. Can you tell us a bit about your work as a principal researcher uh, with CERT Systems? So thank you for having me. Um, at CERT, our mission is to transform the way that uh, the world makes its most important chemicals. And so we have an electrochemical process which can upgrade carbon dioxide into a variety of chemicals and fuels. And uh, so it's pretty daunting, this scale up challenge um, from where we started on an academic lab. When we think about commercial commodity scale chemicals, there's a big gap there. And something that's been, I guess, really helpful for us as we scale up is recognizing where we need to reinvent the wheel and where we can leverage existing expertise from other uh, products and industries. So I guess me coming from an engineering background, my, my tendency is to design everything like specific for my application. But in reality, um, if we take a closer look at a lot of the subcomponents and sub products inside our process, um, they can actually be sort of similar to other um, industries. So uh, in the case of products, if I uh, can leverage the existing manufacturing and distribution chains, um, that's really powerful for me as I scale up. And similarly, uh, if there's a subcomponent of my technology that can leverage an existing uh, sub process, um, I can leverage someone else's like scale up expertise. And so um, by leveraging these, we can leveraging this existing expertise from already uh, existing uh, processes, we can hopefully scale up faster and more efficiently uh, to get our clean tech uh, solutions to market. And where are you at right now uh, on that front in terms of uh, commercialization and market? Access? So uh, we've done uh, a pilot plant demonstration already. It's the largest uh, demonstration that we're aware of um, for carbon dioxide to ethylene, a precursor for polyethylene. Um, but we're looking to implement a few more pilots over the next few years as well, um, based on our learnings from that one. So essentially you're saying uh, taking carbon dioxide, the pollutant and uh, turning it into a plastic potentially down the road. A precursor for Plastic, but, yeah. but being part of that chain, right? So uh, instead of actually getting uh, the precursors for plastic from uh, virgin fossil fuel sources, we could potentially go this route down the road and we will bring you into our uh, circular circular economy panel <laughs> yeah. for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ethan Talbot Schwartz. You have been uh, working on rene renewable energy issues actually outside of Canada. Can you tell us a bit more about your work and um, some of the challenges you face uh, scaling up? Yeah, for sure. So um, I was working previously um, at the time of the nomination for this in a, uh, for a project developer that worked exclusively in emerging markets. So we developed uh, wind and solar projects primarily in Africa and also in South Asia. Um, I specifically was involved on sort of getting our next generation of projects under development in Malawi, and I was specifically looking to develop the country's uh, first utility scale wind farm, which is going to be basically providing um, you know, a fifth of the country's installed capacity. Um, so for context, Malawi is, one of the, is the fifth poorest country in the world. The generation capacity of the entire country is about half the size of the papering plant in uh, in, in, in Ontario. So the market is incredibly rudimentary. So we face a lot of difficulties there in developing because we'd be having a lot of, facing a lot of regulatory challenges, legal challenges in terms of the, the bankability of the market. And in general, it's just not a very investable market. So we were looking, facing a lot of these challenges as a project developer. Um, and we were basically trying to implement sort of like a first of its kind solution working kind of 
trying to propose our own new new land rules to develop on public land without having a, an impact to the communities around it. So it was very, very complex. And uh, my company had previously done solar projects there. So that was a big success. And I kind of came in towards the end of that. And it was a very interesting opportunity working for the developer doing that. Um, I ultimately left to kind of pursue um, more upstream capacity building in the same sector. So now I work for consultancy where we, we advise on a lot of infrastructure projects in Africa, but where I'm specifically interested and focused is, is sort of how you can increase capacity for countries to increase private investment in the renewable energy sectors, uh, because I basically worked on the ground dealing with those challenges quite a bit. So you've got uh, a lot of work cut out for you. Uh, which country, sorry, are you are you focused on next with your current job? At the moment, it's it's basically all throughout um, Africa. A any Anglophone and Portuguese country is the uh, Portuguese speaking country is, is sort of in my domain, but it, it depends on it depends on the project and and it depends on the mandate too. Sometimes it might be quite long, sometimes it will be quite short, but um, there is this focus on kind of supporting countries and increasing their legal and regulatory capacity to increase investment in renewable energy. You've got a big task ahead of you. Uh, we wish you luck with that. And uh, thank you, Ethan. We are now moving into our to our finance camp. The uh, the leaders in this year's 30 under 30 that are working on ensuring that Canada's financial system helps fuel climate action rather than fueling climate change. Uh, it's another gargantuan undertaking um, that the next three 30 under 30 you're going to meet are, are helping to lead. Now you are all tackling this from different angles, Katie, Marco, Pierre Laurent. Uh, can you give us a sense of how you're driving change in the world of finance and what your secret is to taking on these Goliaths and, and not Getting discouraged in the face of daunting system change. Uh, Katie Wheatley, head of Canada uh, for the UNPRI, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you are doing? Absolutely. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. By ways of background, the Principles for Responsible Investment, or the PRI, is a United Nations-supported international network of financial institutions working together to implement six aspirational principles related to uh, embedding responsible investment across their activities and spheres of influence. And today, there are over 5,000 signatories representing 100 and 20 trillion US dollars in assets under management. So it's quite a group that includes, I should note, some other organizations represented by youth leaders in this group. Uh, so my focus has really been on incremental change. And in my work, that really means uh, one asset owner or manager at a time. You know, how can I help this university endowment or this foundation or this indigenous trust today to strengthen its responsible investment governance, knowing that it will have knock on effect effects given their role really at the head of the investment value chain and as the asset owner. How can I foster more opportunities to collaborate to bring capital owners and managers together to strengthen their voices in favor of positive collective outcomes. And I think there are often two ways that we look at this. One would be that you can you know, protest and agitate to exert negative pressure that may prompt change, or you can try to work from the inside in hopes of moving mountains by serving as a resource and a support for investment decision makers to promote sustainability across capital markets. And there's no single right or wrong way to foster change. But for me, it's been a joy to work with and alongside decision makers from uh, pension funds, endowments, universities, foundations, uh, and now investment managers and service providers as well in my role at the PRI to slowly build momentum and mobilize to foster sustainability. And I think that education and empowerment are really uh, important precursors to action. So one of my major priorities has been shedding light on why environmental, social, and governance or ESG issues um, that are traditionally seen as non financially material really do have financial implications for returns um, and ultimately outcomes. You mentioned the uh, slow moving aspect of this change. Uh, are you seeing the that pace increase lately? You're interested to hear your, your thoughts on this uh, from where you're stationed. 
Yeah, I do think that there has been, you know, a huge amount of buy-in really that's grown and the amount of um, decision makers and institutions that are realizing that um, ESG and responsible investment are, uh, you know, not just good marketing, uh, but actually that they're good for their bottom line and that in the long term, uh, when they're favoring companies that are attending to risks and um, you know, liabilities like Indigenous rights and decent work and biodiversity loss that ultimately in the long term, they will outperform. And so there's been you know, a coalescing of momentum and um, and collaboration around this. And uh, I think that it is helping to foster um, systems change. Marco Foligno, as Manager of Sustainable Investing at Bentel Green Oak, um, you have particularly been focused on uh, ramping up investments in the greening of buildings, et cetera. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. It's a pleasure to be here. I work in sustainable investing at Bentel Green Oak, which is a global real estate asset management firm. We have about $80 billion US of real estate around the world. And I focus on creating scalable sustainability solutions that will provide custom recommendations to each of the assets in our portfolio to let them know what they can do to improve sustainability KPIs every single year. Um, and where I've found success is really uh, in the finance space, speaking the same language of those that I'm working with. I find that the sustainability literacy of the average person is not very high. There's a lot of complex metrics uh, that go into creating a green building and not everyone is aware of the ins and outs of every single one of them. So identifying the most material indicators that the firm wants to focus on and then being able to uh, distill that into something that is digestible for someone that is not a sustainability expert is really important. Uh, and, and being able to back that up with a strong value proposition and financial metrics as well uh, to get the buy-in from those um, the stakeholders that I work with. Uh, and I will say, um, Katie's work is very important as well because we do submit to UNPRI and I find benchmarks like that is are very important in driving progress in the finance space because they allow us to receive one single score for overall a ton of different sustainability metrics and that we can share and then benchmark against other peers. So I find a lot of success from wanting to stay above peers or uh, get ahead in certain areas. And so that competitive nature from these benchmarks really help continue progress in the finance space. And you're working on shifting uh, the environmental footprint of a, a sector, buildings that are notoriously um, challenging to to uh, to retrofit. I mean, the, the, they're actually not challenging to retrofit, but they, it's just we have so many of them, and they are around for fifty to hundred years. And there's there there is a lot of work ahead. Can you just give us a quick sense of the impact you've been able to have already? Yeah. So we focused. Uh, we have set a net zero goal for the firm to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And that was a, a recent goal that was set. And so we're in the pro progress of creating roadmaps for each individual fund, um, each strategy, depending on whether the yeah, I think Marco is frozen. So thank you, Marco. We're uh, going to move on to Pierre Laurent Mercredi. Uh, Pierre Laurent, can you tell us a bit more about uh, your work as uh, associate principal in asset management at Fondaction? Great, and uh, and I think Marco just got back. So if we if he wants to continue, he happy to give him the spot again. Sorry, I'm not sure where I got cut off, but I will just finish with, it, it is a long road ahead with a ton of custom solutions and uh, we're really focusing on uh, the low hanging fruit first, of course, but we will need to really take from different innovations going on around Canada and a lot of the work that people in this group are doing will really help us get to the finish line down the road. Thank you, Marco. For, for for context, uh, I work at an organization called Fondaction. It's a labor-sponsored fund based here in Quebec, uh, $3.3 billion, low over 200,000 uh, individual like shareholders across Quebec. And what's unique is uh, entirely dedicated sustainable development since our creation. So 
luckily for everything that I've worked on, I've never had to explain to any of my colleagues why sustainability matters. So that, that's a huge uh, boon. Um, what I've worked on uh, has always been, and, and to kind of bounce off something that Marco just said, uh, is trying to uh, design scalable solutions for uh, impact. Um, you know, I saw, I read a, a study the other day uh, saying that just between 2015 and now, uh, the top five largest banks here in Canada have deployed over $700 billion uh, in the fossil fuel industry uh, here in Canada. That's something that we need to change. And if we continue like that, we're going to overshoot our uh, 2030 uh, climate emission targets by 94%. Look, th th that's not viable. So uh, the way I like to, to make the analogy, I'm in the business of making uh, Italian ice cream. And, and what do I mean by that is right now, most people in the market, most large financial institutions around the world, if they are familiar with sustainability, they're only familiar with kind of very light green type level of sustainability, the Costco frozen yogurt type stuff, which isn't bad by itself. But if you're trying to make large scale, deep impact over time, this is something that they haven't even seen yet. So how can you ask them to do this type of investing if they haven't you know, experienced it yet? So, so that's what, I'm in the job of. Uh, over the past five years, my team and I, we've developed over uh, five different uh, impact funds, uh, ranging from one in the circular economy. Uh, we have we created Canada's first uh, uh, super ESCO energy efficiency fund, Canada's first uh, uh, climate finance um, carbon credit fund, rather to be more specific, called Enlances, and a couple other funds as well. And all of these funds have the uh, goal to be innovative. So showing to these other financiers how they can do impact and also designed in such a way that they're scalable. So, so to date, we've raised from external capital uh, a little over $380 million of, of impact investing capital. If we take into account Fondaction also investing in these funds are a little over half a billion dollars today, but with a very nice roadmap uh, to hopefully hit over a billion dollars in impact investing. Uh, by 2025. Thank you so much, Pierre Lavin. Uh, and one thing that came up uh, as as our last few speakers were uh, were chatting um, was ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors that are being uh, factored into investment decisions across the world. There's now, I think, over 300 billion in assets under management uh, in ESG funds. Um, at the same time, you know, as we as many of you know. Uh, ESG has been coming under fire of late from all sides for being too lax, too woke. Uh, and I wanted to chat with our, our, our next two youth leaders in sustainable finance, Sabrine and Anusha, about their the work they're doing to push corporations to do better and up the bar on what it means to be ESG aligned. Sabrine, did you want to kick things off? Tell us a bit about the what you're doing at uh, as director of ESG reporting at Export Development Canada. Absolutely. Thanks, Adria. Um, and happy to be here with everyone, uh, alongside everyone here. Um, and so maybe before I speak to, I guess, what I do here at Export Development Canada, let's give a quick brief about what EDC is and then also what I um, what, what I think at least ESG aligned means. Um, so Export Development Canada is Canada's export credit agency. So we're a crown corporation and I guess think similar to a financial institution or a bank, but specifically dedicated to helping Canadian companies of all different sizes, whether they're small, medium, or large, who are looking to essentially export um, and do business at the international stage. So that's kind of where we support. Um, and in my eyes, I think really truly what ESG aligned means is to embed ESG across the organization. And I think we hear like similar to what you said in terms of, you know, people are coming under fire. Like you hear a lot of companies committing to this or claiming to do this, but what does it really mean to embed ESG into your organization? I think for me, this means having dedicated ESG teams sit within different parts of your organization. So not just having like a siloed sustainability or, you know, ESG team kind of sitting under a sustainability officer, but having things like an ESG risk team who can manage climate risk, um, an ESG team in your business who can help advance clean tech or inclusive trade. Um, it can also mean things like integrating ESG into your incentive programs, educating the board, um, aligning it to your broader corporate strategy. So I think the list can really go on and on. 
Um, it doesn't negate the need to have a separate sustainability team, but I think it really just kind of speaks to the fact that we need to build on top of that separate team and have capacity and have ESG skill set really across the organization and kind of across all the different executives that lead different parts of an organization. Um, so I just wanted to speak a little bit about that, but I guess uh, in terms of the ways that I'm helping EDC and that ESG is really a couple of different things. So um, I help to lead our annual ESG reporting and disclosure. So managing the public reporting that we do, uh, managing the development of our ESG metrics and working with stakeholders right across the organization. Um, and, you know, I think uh, some others spoke about it too, like the importance of good sustainability metrics, which helps to drive progress at some point because you're comparing to peers and really measuring how you're performing, but um, really looking to build metrics that show measurable performance on how we're doing. Um, and this is really critical because a lot of our progress at EDC um, feeds into Canada's national climate goals and commitments. So for instance, measuring our climate financing in developing countries, it's a key metric that feeds and rolls into Canada's contribution to this commitment as part of um, their participation in the Paris Agreement. Um, and then in addition to that, I also lead our uh, TCFD reporting and strategy. So that's a task force for climate related financial disclosures. So really focusing on how we as a financial institution are managing climate risks and opportunities and then measuring and reporting on our progress against um, our net zero commitment. Thanks, Sabrine. Anusha Lalani, uh, as manager of ESG reporting and assurance at KPMG, um, what are some of the challenges you faced pushing the corporate world to do better and up the bar on the ESG front? I think this is this is a great question, and I'm in more of a client facing role, so it's been interesting to hear uh, what people are doing on the industry side. Um, on the ESG assurance side, I'll talk about that first. Um, I essentially help companies. I essentially help people understand that companies are doing what they actually say that they're doing. We see a lot of marketing and, and green disclosure in ESG reports, but oftentimes when you go in and actually look at the processes and the controls, like is the data that is coming out and being published in this ESG in these ESG reports actually accurate? Um, so we're seeing more clients come in wanting that e wanting that assurance over their ESG metrics at the same, sometimes at a lower level than what is in the financial statements. But slowly we're seeing more companies wanting reasonable assurance, which would be at the same level as the financial statements. And that's because there are different regulations that are now coming out. Um, Canadian public companies, U.S. public companies, there's a proposed climate disclosure rule that these companies will have to start disclosing climate risks and opportunities within their ESG report and within their um, financial statements. So it's trying to get companies to understand that putting out a target is not just putting out a target. You can't just have a net zero target. It's going to impact your assets. It's going to impact your asset life because you're going from high emitting assets to low emitting assets, right? And it seems like there has been a huge gap between what is coming out in the ESG reports and what's being published um, in the ESG reports and what's actually going into the financial statements, what's actually impacting your strategy. Um, and it's helping companies understand ESG is not a marketing exercise. It is something that should be embedded within your strategy and it is something that is going to impact also your compliance with all these future rules that are coming out. So I'll go in and assist clients with, you know, enhancing their governance structure to make sure they're effectively complying with future regulatory requirements, but also helping them understand, you know, there's a value add here. Um, there's a lot of return from embedding ESG into your strategy. So it'll also, I'll also go in, help with strategic integration, you know, developing customized ESG disclosure and operations roadmap, um, addressing, you know, the increasing expectations of different stakeholders, including insurers, providers of capital, regulatory bodies. So there's a much bigger focus on ESG that we're, see that we're seeing, um, especially compared to what is being done historically. So it's really educating companies to understand, you know, ESG also needs right. to sit in your CFO group and in your business strategy group. It's not just, you know, marketing says this and, and that's it. And then nothing's being done within the organization itself. And I think that's a uh... I think that's an important point that really applies to to uh, you know everyone's fields here is you know wanting to ensure that um, uh, green action isn't just marketing and that uh, it, it is uh, strictly applied across you know uh, all of our industries um, and I think one of the ways that we can do that more 
effectively level the playing field is looping in government and making sure government brings in tougher regulation. And then we have two uh, government leaders here with us today working on greening government from the inside. Uh, Curtis and Alex, can you tell us a bit about what drove you to want to specifically work on greening government and some of the challenges you've overcome in driving change from within? And I also just want to be conscious of the clock here. I we, I know we said we give everyone two minutes, but uh, the, the clock is ticking. Um, but Curtis Layden, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, what drove you to want to work with uh, the federal government and some of the challenges you faced uh, bringing in, for instance, sweeping plastic policies in the office of the Ministry of the Environment? Yeah, happy to. Um, I think I first got involved in, in politics and in government back in the 2015 election where I saw you know, the federal government stepping back on protecting the environment, implementing climate plans, rolling back environmental protections, and that really concerned me. And so got involved in politics as a result and have now had the privilege to work for the Minister of the Environment for the past number of years, working on a variety of issues. And you know, folks here have talked about climate change and I think that that takes up a lot of people's attention, but we're also facing you know, planetary crises like biodiversity loss and pollution. And so these are really challenging, seemingly insurmountable problems. And um, I think some of the challenges you face in government are tackling the inertia that you face from potentially industry, even within government itself to, to move on these, these challenges at the scale and pace that's required to make change. I think Jonathan talked about scaling up solutions and um we really struggle with that inside government as well um but i think the way that we get we we overcome that are there's i think three things that come to mind for me one is that when you have the public on side it makes it a lot easier to move um on single use plastics which is a file i've worked on you know we've had anywhere between 70 and 95% support from canadians to ban harmful single use plastics even at the height of the pandemic when plastics became even more essential um Working with colleagues, you know, this is an area we've got 30 sustainability leaders here that care about these issues deeply. And when you have colleagues that care about these issues, it's easier to move the needle. And then lastly is, is more of a public policy tool, but um, at Environment Canada, we have a regulatory toolbox. And so you can move the needle on things by um, implementing laws and regulations. So those are maybe a few reflections on uh, working inside government. Thanks, Curtis, for sharing uh, your perspective on working at the federal level. Alex Cool Fergus uh, is a reach and engagement coordinator with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Uh, working on greening our municipalities is often is, is seen as uh, one of the kind of um, uh, avenues for more rapid change than uh, can be made at the federal level. Alex, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what drove you to go this route and some of the challenges you've overcome? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, the the rapidity, the speed that municipalities move at is definitely something that attracted me to the municipal sector. Um, municipalities in Canada control directly control about 50% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, people tend to look towards the federal government or the provincial governments for climate action. But really, on the ground, we have a lot of municipal uh, climate leaders that are doing all sorts of really innovative and interesting work um, within their own communities to both to both reduce their emissions and also adapt to climate change. Um, so it, uh, it's a privilege to, to get to work with them on a daily basis. And so FCM is a member association of uh, 2,000 member, member municipalities, which represent about 90% of Canadians. Um, and we, we manage the Green Municipal Fund, which is uh, an endowment fund, about $1.6 billion, and it supports municipal projects in the areas of uh, waste, water, energy, sustainable, uh, affordable housing. Um, as well as transportation. And so we're able to provide both funding throughout the whole process and then capacity development as well to municipal leaders um, who are really facing a whole bunch of different challenges, whether that be staff capacity, uh, a lack of resources, a lack of um, just regulatory power. We don't have that kind of power that the federal government has or that other levels of government have. And so um, my work is really just bringing those different challenges um, to the federal level and working with the federal government um, to to make sure that municipalities are being heard um, and that also that, that they are aware that you know, the municipal sector and municipal governments are truly willing partners um, towards achieving climate action in Canada. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so much to unpack there. And uh, you talked about uh, the challenges in, in having voices heard. 
And I think that's one that is um, that resonates with uh, with most of our 30 under 30 leaders, uh, particularly our next two speakers who uh, are focused very much on inequality. Um, and you know, we all know tackling inequality is a key component of the just transition, um, and greening our economy. But it is a specific focus of Nabila and Kate. Uh, can you both tell us a little bit about how tackling inequality through the organizations you founded? Um, how you're doing that and share some of the challenges you've faced in getting your sectors on board. Nabila Merchant uh, founded Canadian Women in Venture Capital and is a senior associate with TELUS Pollinator Fund for Good. Can you tell us a bit about the work you're doing on gender equality and how that's vital to the green transition? Sure thing, Adria. Um, it's nice to be here with everyone today. Uh, quickly, Canadian Women in Venture Capital very self-explanatory in the name of a grassroots organization that helps promote and retain women in venture capital through many different avenues. So networking, boot camps, mentorship, uh, we have a Slack platform as well. Uh, and we're really moving you know, beyond the connection to uh, being the voice of women in venture through advocacy and increased transparency. Uh, and the thesis here is by creating space for women investors to thrive, we're hoping to influence how traditional power structures work and who and what gets funded. Um, you know, we've seen that women see money as a tool to affect change and recognize the importance of their participation in, and use financial decisions as a path to greater impact. So they're more likely to invest with environmental, social, and governance values in mind. Uh, you'd asked about challenges, but what I found has been so encouraging uh, in my experience is how supportive the Canadian VC ecosystem has been so far. I think that there's a high level understanding that we have a representation problem that impacts who we fund, uh, but also big questions about how to create inclusive environments. Uh, and we give funds an opportunity to be meaningful allies through mentorship, through policy change and sponsorships. I think when you come with action that they can take, they're ready to embrace it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nabila. Kate Tashenko, uh, you founded the Queer Infrastructure Network and uh, have a background working in uh, the construction sector on green construction. Uh, how have you tackled and faced getting your sectors on board with uh, recognizing gender equality and how vital it is to the green transition? It's definitely been an interesting journey. And to take a step back, the Queer Infrastructure Network, uh, short form being Quinn, is an industry group focused on not only inclusion, but working to work with companies and organizations in our industry to bring them up to a level that we're looking at better uh, equity for 2S LGBTQ folks, and specifically looking at the folks in our community who do not have access to the central power structure. So looking at trans folks and different intersections of folks who aren't white. So when we look at that, one of the largest challenges we've had is internal change versus external change, which is why Quinn ended up being a thing, because I'm sure many people know on this call, internal change is quite hard. And unless you have a group or a pressure externally, it's really hard for organizations to change. We've seen that with sustainability. We've seen that with diversity, equity, and inclusion. So that's what we're try really trying to focus on is bringing that external pressure, getting that voice and legitimacy in the industry, and spreading that across all sectors within the infrastructure sector and beyond. And one of the other challenges that we look at is how the industry talks about the binary in terms of gender. And there's not a gender binary. Gender is expansive. Gender is whatever someone wants to be on a certain day if that's how people look at it. And that's one of the other challenges we're looking at is when we partner with industry organizations, let's say a women's focus organization or anything else, we really see it as a challenge to say, okay, we can partner and we can push things forward. But additionally, we need to make sure that we're not reinforcing the gender binary in what we're doing and how we're doing it. Thank you, Kate. Uh, again, we've got you know a whole other panel we're going to launch just on this conversation. <laughs> uh, and we are uh, now getting to our final uh, 30 to 30 leader here with us today. Kat is the executive director of the Youth Harbor and you're specifically uh, focused on empowering up and coming youth leaders, uh, helping them with their youth led projects. What advice do you have for young people having trouble getting their work recognized? Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, so 
really am the executive, executive director of the Foundation for Environmental Stewardship, one of those projects being the Youth Harbor. And what we found is that a lot of youth-led initiatives are critically underfunded, despite being at the forefront of social innovation, and also understanding that within this exclusive world of philanthropy, as a youth-led organization, it's really difficult to actually secure funding. So FES really operates as this intermediary between institutional philanthropists and grassroots organizations, because we know ultimately that sustainability, pollution, climate issues is really a justice issue. And so far these marginalized identities have not been represented in these decision-making tables. And one of the ways to get them represented is through finance. So at FES and the Youth Harbor, not only do we provide financial assistance, we've raised $1.5 million so far to redistribute that to grasslands groups all throughout what's currently referred to as Canada. We also provide that technical support so youth initiatives can reasonably start, scale, and sustain their initiatives. And I guess my basic, very quick note to youth to get their work recognized is that understanding that if you are the youngest person in the room, if you're the only person that reflects a certain identity in the room, it's not a reason that you should not be there, it's a reason that you should be there. So use it as an opportunity to engage, to infiltrate, and to advocate for what your needs are, but the needs are for our future generations as future ancestors um, towards this beautiful planet. Thank you for for uh, ending us off there. We actually would like to go around the uh, virtual room for a little rapid fire round of questions, mostly really to get your advice for other uh, budding emerging youth leaders that are listening in today um, and just, you know, your 20 second advice to them uh, either on breaking through or, you know, one of the themes that came up a lot in our conversations with the 30 under 30 um, was also just the, you know, the struggles of, uh, of, of dealing with of making sure our mental health is as sustainable as our uh, planet's sustainability when we are leaders trying to make change uh, in, a, in a challenging setting. So I'm going to go around um, just the Hollywood squares here and, uh, and, and see if any of you have any final words of wisdom to share. Stephanie, did you want to kick things off? Sure. Um, really just to, to prioritize your mental health because uh, like you said, I think that in order to do the work that we do, you have to really take care of yourself. And so um, making sure to make time for uh, what fuels you. I know that a lot of us, like I could tell from the conversation, so, so many of us are so passionate about what we do and it makes it uh, difficult for it not to run into your, your personal life and to, to make it your entire uh, waking existence. But uh, you know, take that time to take care of yourself, go to the movies, go on that walk, um, because it'll fuel you and and uh, continuing to to do this this great hustle for uh, sustainability. Thanks, Stephanie. Alex, any words of advice? I was just thinking. I mean, very much along the same lines. But for me, what's really helped is finding my people, um, and whether that be close to home or far from home, like just having those couple of friends or people that I've met throughout the years that I can reach out to, um, and, and kind of share successes and also failures and questions. Um, but that's been really helpful for me over the years. Mm. Good advice, Aaron. What about you? Well, transparently, I mean, I know I'm one of those people who have struggled with mental health for sure over the last couple of years, but one of the best ways to come over that is definitely community and putting collaboration over competition always. That's the, the way to go, in my opinion. Mm. Sage advice. Mark Silverman? I'd like to echo what uh, Kat said, which is really to not let your youth stand in your way. In a lot of ways, you know, we've learned more, way more than previous generations about these problems. And often older uh, members of society will look to us to for those solutions. So just don't think that your youth is standing in your way. It's actually um, an advantage. And if you spot a, a gap in the market or something, take the initiative and, and try to fill it. You'll you'd be amazed at what you can achieve just by trying. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. Jonathan, how about you? I would say just um, taking a little bit different angle. I think really just understanding why you're doing things and taking some enjoyment in your what you're doing every day and not losing sight of the big picture, I think can be really rewarding as well. Uh, at times it can be overwhelming, but uh, it can also be like, just enjoy what you're doing as well. Mm -hmm. Good advice. We kind of, you, you can get bogged down by the negatives of the world, but if you're actually enjoying the work of 
So finding the solutions, you can find some balance. Nabila, what about you? I don't know if I have anything new to add to the conversation. Uh, That's okay. But, what works for you? Uh, I, I tend to find like leaning into the seasonality of things helps. Uh, maybe echoing uh, what has been talked about in terms of take the time that you need to fuel yourself um, and not be discouraged when you find that there's sometimes you need to step back and sometimes you need to step in. We can't be full on all the time. Just not enough fuel in our tanks. Thanks, Nabila. Katie, what are your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, I would say definitely focus on finding your niche, marrying your passion with your skill set. Um, and that'll often lead to rewarding long term work and opportunities. But do also take your vacation to refresh because it's in downtime that your imagination and innovative streaks reemerge. Mm, such a good point. So true. Pierre Laurent? I, I echo everything that one you just said. Uh, so try and think about something different. Um, I would say uh, to to add on Alex's point of finding your people, I would say that that also adds to choose the right organization and the right people that you're going to work with, people that will actually invest in you and your growth and your success and with whom you can also contribute to their growth and success and make a mutually beneficial uh, uh, relationship. That's super cool. Curtis. Um, I'd say get involved early, get involved often, and definitely echo the comments around finding your people and community. These are daunting challenges and there can feel like there's a lot of pressure, but um, talking about the talking about those issues and, and finding that support network is key. Mm. Milton, you've got a com community member with uh, Sanj uh, who happens to be gone right now, but uh, could you share your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I definitely would echo and, and uh, suggest getting somebody that you can really lean on and, you know, you each have ups and downs and motivation or things going on. So it's it's definitely a good idea there. The other thing I would add for young people that are kind of thinking, how do I get started? How do I get involved in sustainability if that's something you care about, which hopefully it is, uh, is the, the best thing is just to try something, you know, dip your toe in. Um, I think a lot of people overanalyze and just get stuck thinking about what's going to be the perfect in. And I think the best learning experience is just to try. And, and a lot of time, it's a lot scarier to before you even actually go into it. Once you're into it or whatever initiative, it's not actually that scary of a thing. Mm, I like that. Sabrine. Uh, so I was going to say something along the lines of what Katie said, but I think, you know, or when, when you're earlier on in your career, it can be uncertain sometimes and it's hard to find your footing. And I think especially from what we've seen today with everyone here from so many different backgrounds, we see that this space is such an interdisciplinary field. Um, so there's no set path to becoming a leader in this space. So really just trying to take your background, your skill set and your strengths and then merging that with your passion and really establishing your space in that niche. Great advice. How about you, Ethan? Yeah, I would say kind of echo what Milton said, just really uh, be curious because you have nothing to lose. Like, I mean, I personally took me a long time to figure out that I was even interested in this whole space. And I think that only came about because I was curious. So I think um, everything else everyone says is really important to you. But to me, it's like, just be curious because that's just how you're going to learn as much as possible and that's how you're going to make the most impact on you. Mm, thanks for that. Kate, how about you? Hard to follow, but one thing that came to mind was that if there's a gap, you might be the person to fill it. I mean, we've got tons of founders around the table here and these are all people who, are, who found gaps and filled them and I can attest the personal experience that it's scary and intimidating and there's lots of kind of personal questioning of are you doing the right thing? Are you doing it at the right time in the right space? And it's always going to work out um and it's better to it's great to reach out to people who've also founded gaps too and one thing i did want to shout out is an amazing group called diversity and sustainability uh they're such an amazing group and if you don't know about them please do they do a lot of work uh highlighting uh non-white folks in sustainability and trying to create more opportunities fabulous thank you shivani do you want to close this out sure um i think from my perspective, I think it's really about 
recognizing your own agency as well. Uh, all of us come from very different backgrounds and have different barriers that are in front of us. But I think across the board, you do have um, a certain level of agency and kind of trust in yourself that you you can go out and create your own opportunities and being creative with the solutions of what you're passionate about and what feels right for you to work on. Um, like others said, there is no there is no one set path. And I think most jobs out there aren't on a job board. Um, and so really being, I guess, innovative in, in, in what works for you and, and creating your own path is important. Wow, you guys have been so inspiring. I, I, I'm left with goosebumps. I just, uh, I, I know our audience and attendees are, ha, have been enjoying this too. I wish we had more time. Thank you for your patience and letting us go over. Thank you for your time and sharing your insights with us today. Like I said, I wish we, we had more time to sit and chat an hour with each of you, but uh, we're looking forward to uh, connecting with you in the future and we will be keeping an eye on all of you uh, as sustainability leaders. And uh, I would also like to extend a thank you to Jan and Meridian for making the 30 under 30 possible. Uh, and just a final event plug, go to corporatenights.com slash events to register for our Better World MBA event. Uh, the Canadian edition is happening happening on Thursday, November 24th at 10 a.m. Thanks, everyone. Good luck with all you do. And uh, thanks for the inspiration today.